If you're in a martial art and you want to fight and you never practice really fighting, you're not going to be very good at it. Good day to you, and thank you for tuning in. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 354, and today I'm joined by our guest, Mr. Tim Cartmel. My name's Jeremy Lesnack. I'm your host on the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and I love the martial arts. I love the traditional martial arts. It's kind of been my life since I was, well, very small. I'm still very small, but I'm at least older now. Enough of that. It's getting silly. Let's talk about Whistlekick. Whistlekick, we make this show, we make uniforms and sparring equipment and a number of other things to enhance your training experience. And you can find all of those items at whistlekick.com and many of them are available on Amazon. If you shop on whistlekick.com, you can use the code podcast15 to save 15% on everything. I've got a ton of t-shirts and just check it out. If you haven't been over there lately, check it out. We're adding new stuff pretty much every week. If you're new to the podcast, you might want to check out our show notes. Those are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and we do a lot to add context each and every episode from photos and videos of the guests, links to their social media, their websites, and pretty much any time we talk about something on the show, we'll give you a link to it, whether it's another episode that we've done, or maybe just another website or a YouTube video, just whatever it is. We try to give you as much as we can around the show notes to bring value to your experience listening to this show. Today's guest has trained all over the world in multiple arts. He's competed. He has a school. He's lived the passionate, dedicated martial arts life that many others have. But here today on the show, he goes in depth as to his mindset and what he's learned, how he's bettered himself through that process. I found it fascinating. I found it relatable. And I've got a feeling you will also. So I'll step back and welcome him to the show. Mr. Cartmill, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being here. We almost didn't make it. You were the second one on the docket for today. And I had already had to reschedule the first one because, listeners, I live in the woods. I live in the woods of, depending on how you term your geography, central or northern Vermont. And we had a wet snowstorm overnight and into this morning. and power lines down and trees down and oh it's been it's been chaotic but this must have been meant to be because literally five minutes maybe 10 minutes before the recording time it came back on and i went oh, let's see if he's there and he was there and you were there and mm-hmm. i appreciate it. it's a sign it is a sign it's a sign we're gonna run with it let's talk about why we're actually here though we're not here to talk about whether we're not here to talk about the perils of living in the woods of Northern Vermont, we're here to talk about martial arts because you and I and most of the folks listening are martial artists. So let's talk about martial arts. Let's talk about how you got started. What's that story? Uh, Well, um, when I was a child, uh, we're pretty rough and tumble as kids. And I I was kind of, you know, we'd wrestle a lot. My uncles uncles taught taught me to box a little bit. And uh, so I kind of had a, you know, kind of a, a predisposition to that kind of thing. And I can't remember where I first saw kind of Asian martial arts, maybe karate on TV or something. And I uh, was immediately fascinated. You know, there was kind of these whole systems of, of martial arts people trained in. And, you know, when you're a kid too, anything age, it seemed very exotic when they were Asian. So um, I started asking my parents, I remember when I was, must have been 10, if I could do karate. That's only, the only other martial art I'd heard of. So, you know, it went a couple years and then the Kung Fu series came on and then it was, you know, me and every, every one of my friends wanted to be like Kwai Chan Kane, right? So I started asking and, and uh, I was probably 11, I think, and, and I started doing uh, Taekwondo. And I did that for, I want to say a year. And then um, I switched. I found a, a Kung Fu school and I went to train and I stayed at that, in that system at least till, uh, till I was out of college and I went to Asia. Mm. And so I practiced, it was Kung Fu San Su, and uh, I started, I must have been 12, and I was about 23 when I left. So I practiced virtually daily uh, from being a kid in, until that age. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. So what, what kept you going? I loved it. 
it was, it was one of the, you know, sometimes in life you find something, you know, like some athletics or, or, or a hobby or, you know, kids, kids want to learn to play an instrument. And, you know, a lot of kids will play for a year or two and be like, yeah, you know, I'm not really into it. Or, and then you, you find something that for whatever reason, who knows, I don't know, whatever reason you really feel like, like, uh, you found your niche kind of thing. And that's, that's how it was with me in martial arts. So I never, in honesty, I, in honesty, I never really, I never really analyzed it. I just did it. And I just, it just seemed like something that I just, uh, would do, you know, like it was a nat became like a natural part of my, my life. So, um, I like, I liked everything about it, but I'm not really sure. You know, I think I've, I've asked myself this question. I still practice every day now. It's been, you know, 40 some years. So for whatever reason, it was one of those things. I, I found martial arts and, and, uh, I just loved doing it. I liked everything about it and I just, just kept doing it. Now, here we are 40 something years later, you're still training, as you said, every day. Mm -hmm. And that's something that continues to blow me away. The number of people who will train every day, because in, in our society, especially in Western culture, we, we tend to get bored. We tend to move on to the next thing, the best thing, the greatest thing, whatever. And we don't see a lot of personal practices that involve anywhere close to daily ritual, especially when it comes to something challenging like martial arts, and especially when it comes to doing it for decades. Yeah. But martial arts seems to be an exception, doesn't it? Do you have any thoughts? You've been practicing longer than I have. Any idea why martial arts seems to speak to some of us so strongly? Well, like I said, it's hard to say. I think, I think, I think the, the art part is, is part of it. You know, people, there, there's a certain amount of, I mean, there's the discipline to do it, but people have discipline for a lot in a lot of it. I mean, getting up, going to work every day requires discipline, right? I think it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's something that we do, but I feel like, you know, you have all these different reasons for doing martial arts. You might want to learn self-defense. You might want to compete. You know, you might like the culture, you know, if you, if you practice an art from another country, but there's something about the um, self-cultivation aspects, aspects of it. I feel people, I feel like if it becomes rote, like you go, ah, I need to work out every day. I'll just do martial arts. You won't keep doing it. You know what I mean? You'll, you'll, like you just said, you'll, you'll find, you'll find the next exercise method or you'll try something new, but there's something about the art part where th there's a, it's kind of a vehicle for self-cultivation. And once you start it and it could, you know, you could, you could cultivate yourself in a lot of different ways. But I, if you, if you're inclined towards something athletic and you have that kind of, um, drive to practice and then you see the benefit and you can see you, you're never going to get, you're never going to master it. There, there's always room for improvement. I feel like that, that's maybe one of the, the, the critical points. So if you say, well, I just want to be in shape. So you say, you know, I get up every morning and I, I don't know, I jog and I lift weights for an hour and I'm in shape. That's, that's fine. But there's no, there's no, you know, unless you're a, a professional athlete or something, you don't really have a, an idea of constant improvement. So that becomes, that becomes a, uh, you know, a worthwhile discipline, but it's more of a chore, more of a chore. I feel, you know, people who love the martial arts and keep doing it, I feel like they, they have this idea of continual self-improvement. So you get, you know, you get an exercise benefit, you get sometimes a meditative benefit. If you practice, you know, in a group, of course, you have friends, you know, you, you have social interaction as well. You learn self-defense skills or like when I competed, you know, you're always looking for uh, you know, better technique or better ways to train. So there's a lot, a lot to it. And I feel like that self-cultivation kind of, uh, at least, at least, uh, uh, the hope or the, or the, the idea of constant improvement might be, might be the, that might be the, the catalyst for, for that, for that lifetime practice. Yeah, I can, I can see that. I have a feeling we're going to come back to this is a theme for you, but let's move on for the moment. Okay. And let's, let's consider your, your time, your training, your, your 40, however many years. Mm -hmm. And if you're like most martial artists, pretty, I, I would venture to say every martial artist, you've got stories. I you've guess. got great stories, stories that make you laugh, stories that make you cry, stories that make you say, oh, I can't believe I did that. I was, I was that dumb or, or anything like that. I know a, a lot of my stories have that heading. I can't believe that I was that dumb. But if I was to ask you for your favorite story from your time training, what would that be? 
Oh, wow. That, that, uh, that's a tough question. I have a, a lot of stories. I, uh, so I spent, I spent 11 years in China training and, uh, you know, besides the time I was here. And then when I came back, I started practicing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I've done that the last, last 20 some years. So there's kind of, in my mind, I have, um, I mean, they're not, they're not comp compartmentalized, but I have like different eras. You know what I mean? There's like kind of, cause I haven't done the same thing the whole time besides, the, well, I've done some of the same things, you know, but I've had whole different experiences. So, you know, as a child, when I started training at, f at first, it was, it was, I mean, I like, like I said, I like the whole uh, idea of, of these, these kind of structured, um, exotic martial arts, but the underlying idea I've always had is I, I, um, I wanted to learn how to fight better, like a lot of people. And then, you know, once you learn self-defense, it goes beyond that. But, uh, even to this day with my students and I know they all compete in sport, combat sport venues of different kinds, but there has to be an underlying realism. So that's always fascinated me, like efficient ways to, to, uh, of body use, like ways to develop your, your physicality and your personal kind of, uh, physical skill and then like the most efficient ways of applying it. And then there's different, there's different venues for that. So, um, I got stories, I mean, you know, as a child at, or, or when I was in my teens, that kind of thing, that kind of training. And then all the time I was in China and I competed and then, uh, I, you know, it's hard to say there's, there's no real, I, I feel like it's unfair to, if I talk about, you know, some teachers in my experiences and not others. And they're all kind of, in my mind, they're all equally as important at, at different times in my development. But my early training when I did Kung Fu, it was, uh, the style was self-defense based. You know, it was, it was, it was, uh, you know, we did forms, we did all kinds of uh, like, like traditional exercises, but everything was based on self-defense. So at the time it was about those skills and, you know, how well they work for me. And then, um, when I went to, I, I lived in Taiwan most of the time in Beijing part of the time. And I practiced primarily uh, Chinese internal styles. But after a year in Taiwan, I started to fight in the Sanda, the Chinese kickboxing tournament. So um, I feel like I had a, uh, I got, you know, those kind of experiences where I had a, I had a, a realistic uh, avenue of testing what I learned, which I found fascinating. So, and then I came back, like I said, and I started competing in a, in a, submissions, grappling, and jujitsu things. So um, I, can't, I can't come up with one story, but now you know my background. If you have any, any questions about any particular time, I could probably come up with a story. <laughs> well, you know, you're talking about competing in, I think you said full contact kickboxing. I mean, that's generally when people talk about kickboxing, it is full contact right. in China. Right. Now, some folks that we have that listen will understand what kickboxing looks like over here the majority just based on numbers haven't participated in any kind of full time, full contact competition. But when we talk about it in other countries, I have no idea what that looks like. So are there any stories from your time competing in that? Yeah. That might be um, interesting? Well, so I went, uh, when I, I, I went to Taiwan and I trained, I practiced a uh, first an art called Xing Yu Chen, which is uh, one of the kind of big three internal Chinese martial arts in a, in a fight school. And, um, you know, I had a background obviously from as a kid, but I'd never competed. The, the Kung Fu I did as a kid was it's, it's, it's geared completely towards kind of, you know, self-defense things in the street and that kind of thing. And there was no competition. So I was there about nine months training and, uh, my teacher, uh, just told me one day he entered me in a tournament and in all honesty, I, I, I totally didn't want to do it. I didn't feel like I had enough training. But it was interesting. Their idea was, you know, you've trained almost a year. You need to go fight, which, which is was, had a big influence on my subsequent coaching, you know, competing is not for everyone, but you know, if you're usually, especially if you're younger and you're doing something martial by definition, you want to see if you can fight with it. Right. So anyway, I went to compete and, uh, I got like, I don't know, fourth place and I got a beat up pretty, pretty bad. And it changed that one experience though, uh, fighting and under those, uh, those circ circumstances with that kind of pressure, had a huge influence on my, on my subsequent, subsequent, uh, personal training and, and to this day on how I coach. So th this is an interesting thing. Sometimes you have these kind of seminal, uh, experiences in your life that you, at first, you know, it's out of your comfort zone and you think, ah, you know, 
you might, you might, in your subconscious, you might think, man, that would be a great experience. But your rational mind's like, man, this is, this is going to be tough. Or you have an ego involved. You think, wow, you know, what if I lose? And, and that kind of thing. But sometimes you need to pull the trigger. And for me, that was a, it kind of changed my life. So forever after that, I was, when these situations would come up, I'd be more likely, you know, even if I was nervous about it or, you know, my ego got involved, I would be more likely to say, not nah, that's, that's exactly what I need. Right. So after that one experience, um, I did okay, but, but, uh, I didn't win. And after that, I, I, I had a, a very, very clear idea of what I needed to do to improve and even my mindset, everything. And so I went back to train and, uh, then I competed for the next couple of years and I never lost. I won, I won every, uh, every subsequent tournament. And I don't feel like I was, I don't feel like I was as talented actually as a lot of people that I beat. I feel like my initial experience and the way I reacted to it kind of was the catalyst for my entire um, uh, kind of change in point of view and training. So if I could offer advice to anyone, that would, that would be it as well. Sometimes you need to get out of your comfort zone and, and uh, you know, do things like that. And win or lose, I lost, I lost my first tournament, and yet it was kind of uh, life-changing in, in a way. So. That's a good, that was a good experience. So Sanda, the, 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 in, in, in Taiwan at the time, um, Chinese kickboxing, they have, there's amateur and professionals, professionals in Taiwan at the time, you could punch, kick, knee, elbow, and throw, and there was no ground fighting. So it was kind of like, you know, pretty much all in stand-up fighting. So it was fairly, you know, there's rules obviously, but it was fairly realistic and, and uh, you know, it was full contact and we'd have to fight um, several times in a day back then. Like if you, there were, if you fought, you advanced, you know, from like, you know, quarter or semi quarter, semi all the way to the final. So it was pretty, a pretty good test of endurance and, and, and just kind of mental toughness. So that's, uh, that's how I, that, that's kind of like one of the biggest experiences I had. And I had a lot of like remarkable, uh, teachers. There's, a, there's a lot of, I think, I think I talk about this a fair amount. There's a, there's a real demarcation now between, you know, people that want to do combat sports. So they want to practice MMA or, or any kind of combat sport. And then people who do what, what they would term traditional martial arts. And, and sometimes people feel like they're, they're almost, they're almost opposite ends of the spectrum. Like they're, they're opposite in polarity. I think that's totally not true. And I feel, I feel that uh, people who do combat sports, if they find, the right teacher and, and the relevant material, there's a lot of really good things you can learn from tradi traditional training that, that maybe a combat sport athletes discount when they first see it. I, I see it with my own students, you know, most I, so now I'm the head instructor at a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Academy and I teach um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu submissions to wrestling and I coach some, some pro MMA fighters on, on uh, their grappling coach. And uh, it's hard to convince these young, like super athletic kids that, some, some of these practices have any benefit because you don't see it. It doesn't look mainstream. And, and you know, at, at first glance, they don't seem to be super practical. And I understand that. So um, my advice as well is it, it, it's no matter what you're into, if it's good to look at, at uh, different things, all the traditional sport fighting come from traditional martial arts originally. Right. So uh, I think there's, there's a lot to be, to be said for it. So I have to, you know, have like eternal gratitude to all the teachers that I had um, for all the, the different aspects of the training. So uh, we did some, when I was in Taiwan as well, we, you know, we did some fairly hard, it was hardcore training, but the internal has a whole different, a whole different, um, they approach the training from a different stance as, as some of the other styles, like, like what people would call the harder styles. So uh, that was also, I had my teachers, I had some, some teachers that were, uh, had been through, you know, a lot of stuff and they fought a lot of, they'd been through the war and, uh, they could do incredible. Like people don't believe me sometimes when I tell them like the kind of things they could do. So a lot of these things are possible if you have the right training and, and, uh, you put in the work. Um, so I would, I would just, just as a takeaway from, from all that training and my competition experience, it's very, it's not a good idea to discount things that have been around a long time that people have been doing because they wouldn't have been around that long if they didn't work. So that's yeah. kind of my, my full contact experience. And after a couple of years, I, I stopped fighting and I went to train, 
I went to the mainland, mainland China, and trained. And I trained with, uh, I was fortunate to find some very, very famous older, ma- they're all gone now, but older masters that had been around from, from the, the early 20, 20th century when they trained. So that was also uh, interesting. There, there's very few people that, that train in old school to that level anymore. So I was fortunate to see what they were actually capable of. Now, when that word's kicked around, old school, or traditional, or, or, or however you want to slice it, people have different ideas of what that means. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I, I started martial arts in the early 80s, and from my understanding, my un- instructors came from a, a fairly old school kind of, I don't know if I want to say hardcore, but, you know, at, at least a, a heavy tradition and, and some difficult training, and I experienced that as a young child. Mm-hmm. But I've heard stories from other people that, make what I went through seem trivial. Mm-hmm. And then I know other people who look at the training that I went through and think, oh, who would ever even go through that? So when you talk about, you know, that old school level of training that you experienced from these great masters on mainland China, what would that look like to, to the rest of us? What would we see? Well, first of all, we had a lot of time. You know, I, I did. So when I was in Asia, I, I worked enough to, to, uh, you know, make ends meet, but I uh, trained a lot, uh, hours and hours a day, because that's what I was there for. So uh, one of the things is the sheer volume of time that they, they put in. So nowadays, I mean, you'd have to be a career martial artist or a professional combat sport athlete, I think, to have that much time. So it's not really fair, actually, to compare, you know, like if, you're, if you do martial arts as a hobby, and even if you train, you know, four or five days a week for an hour or two, you, you can't compare because these guys... And I did as well at the time, you know, we train hours a day, we train, you know, up to six hours sometimes a day. So that, that's one thing. Now, obviously if you have a method and, and your, your stuff's legit, if you train that much, you're going to get good at it, you know, and if you have a lot of talent, you're going to get really good at it. So one thing is people have to understand is they had a lot of time. They, they were training a lot. So the traditional training that I, that I, that I did with them it, from the internal perspective, um, there's a lot of, emphasis put on, on, uh, specific ways to, to kind of cultivate and generate power. So there's a lot of emphasis put on your alignment, kind of your structural alignment, your posture, you know, how you hold your body and certain movement patterns. So there's a lot of standing in the beginning, you know, holding different, John Zhuang in Chinese, like holding different positions. A, a lot of it, we do, we do quite a bit of that. And it's, it's, uh, it's torturous actually. I'm not even, you know, and in all honesty, too, I'm not, I'm not really sure if standing as long as we did is even necessary. Maybe it's partly it's just mental, I feel, just, just to, you know, because it's a grueling thing to stand in these positions for so long. So that was part of it, a big part. And then, you know, endless repetitions of, of basic movements was another, another big thing. So not, not very exciting at first, but it ingrains these movement patterns so they become, you know, fundamentally first nature. And then, you know, you go on from there and then, then forms, um, practicing traditional form. And then, then you take the technique out of the form. And the one thing they have, they have that I feel that it would be a benefit to a lot of um, combat sport athletes is you can, kind of, you can kind of break down martial training. You have solo training, obviously. So you've got to condition, do your forms, you know, do your whatever, your strength training, all that kind of stuff. And then, then there's training with a partner. So training with a partner can range from doing cooperative technique training all the way to full contact sparring. And I find now um, what I see in a lot of, a lot of schools or a lot of academies, traditional as well, there, there's kind of a, there's not enough time spent in what I call like the mid range of training. So, so what you'll get is, for example, in a lot of say a jujitsu class, because you have limited time, you'll, you'll teach a student a technique and they'll practice it on each other with absolutely no resistance. So, you know, say you learn how to do some kind of a joint lock and you'll practice it. I'll practice it. We'll go back and forth till we get the idea, you know, maybe learn a couple of techniques and then bam, you're sparring. And then it's 100% resistance, uh, right off the bat. So I feel if, if there's time constraints, that, that's really the only logical way to go. But if you have a little more time and you can schedule a time better, one of the, one of the, the training methods that we did, traditional training methods, they have between the, not the, completely compliant uh training and the 100 percent non-compliant full sparring training in between that there's there's various uh training methods and levels of force 
that we did a lot. And I feel like this is a missing link in a lot of people's training. For example, you know, everyone knows in Tai Chi, you have things like pushing hands, right? So pushing hands is an example that everyone would know. It's not, it's not co completely cooperative, but there's parameters. You're, you're basically testing each other's sensitivity and balance and, you know, your frame and power. But since it's not full contact, no one's getting hit or thrown down hard, you're a little calmer and you have more time, you know, to, to focus on certain variables of sensitivity. So that would be an example. And of course, you have to go beyond that. If you're not, if you're in a martial art and you want to fight and you never practice really fighting, you're not going to be very good at it. It's like any other endeavor. You got to approximate your event as closely as possible, but there's different ways to train to get there. Right? So that would be one example, or, uh, there's different levels of sparring. So sometimes, uh, when I practice the Yi Chuan in the school, we would have drills like, you know, um, I'm only allowed to punch. You're only allowed to throw. So you've got to be able to defend yourself and take me down without hitting me. And I've got to be, I have to, I have to practice hitting you and not let you take me down. Or maybe I can only kick and you can only punch. So these things are kind of um, uh, intermediate, not, not completely cooperative, not completely full sparring. There's more rules, but they force you to work on, on variables you might not, not work on. For example, if I really like to punch, you know, and every time we spar full contact, I just try to punch you, right? So my, my grappling's lacking. So I'm forced to work on my grappling. You say, okay, all you can do is grapple. He's going to punch you, that kind of thing. There's, and there's a lot. When I practiced internal, there was, there was a... a, a a long or, or quite a big range of these, these practices. And I feel like they really maximize the training time. So um, that was part of the, a big part of the training uh, was, was like different levels of these drills or, you know, jujitsu has its counterpart. You might just drill a position or you might drill where, you know, my, no matter you know we're sparring, but all I'm allowed to do is arm bar. So these kind of drills I feel should be practiced this should be most of the partner training and then, you know, full contact, 100% uh, sparring needs to be done, but maybe not as much as, as some schools do it. You know, maybe some of these intermediate drills would be, would, would help them uh, improve a little bit quicker. So that was, that was traditional training. That's and not that, not that modern training doesn't have that kind of thing, but, but uh, you know, that's where I was first introduced to it. So a lot of, a lot of alignment work, a lot of basics, a lot of holding positions, a, a lot of repetitive single movements, a lot of form repetition, and then drilling techniques, drilling techniques, and then these other practices. So that's basically how, how it went. And then, you know, like I said, my school expected you to fight and, uh, and you know, go and fight, like go, go and compete to see. Mm. Right on. You know, I, I do want to speak a little bit to what you brought up with, with the, the transition, the often rapid transition from very light, we'll say slow or no resistance in partner techniques, and then taking the the large leap into free sparring and, and often heavier sparring, you know, heavier contact. And it's true. I see a lot of schools that don't have that transitional work. And I was lucky enough that I grew up with some of that. And anyone that has had me come to their class and teach, if I'm teaching anything combat related, that's actually where we spend most of our time. Mm -hmm. And I just want to point out, and I'm, I'm fairly certain you'll agree, but because it's an important concept, it is the lack of this, this training in that middle space that holds people back. Because what do we tend to do if, if we're put in, the more intense the situation, the more likely we are to fall back on the things we're most comfortable with. And that doesn't give people the opportunity to improve the things that they're just kind of figuring out. If, you, if you're throwing a kick at their head at anything approaching <laughs> a high velocity or, or, or power, they're not going to be experimenting with the technique that they just learned 20 minutes ago. Oh, absolutely correct. Yeah. I think too, <laughs> there's a, there's kind of a, um, also it's going it, to, it, it comes in handy, this, this kind of um, parameters, putting parameters or, or, uh, you know, limits on, on what people are training. I see it a lot. It's like, it's kind of like, I call it, it's like the curse of blue belts in jujitsu. So people will train for a year or two and they'll, they'll have decent skill right in, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, for example. But then what happens every time they spar, they go, ex they go right to their best game and they just, that's all they, so, you know, say the guy favors his guard. So every time he goes to spar, he pulls guard. He never, he, you know, he might end up on top. He might sweep the guy, he might get on top, but he really, really likes to be on his back. And then, you know, some people never go on, like a lot of my guys who wrestled, they never want to go on their back because it's foreign to them. So you need to make them do it. You need to work 
once you have a game as well, not only with beginners, once, once you're decent and, and you're, you know, you, so you're winning like that. So your, your brain, of course, likes success. So it's going to keep going back to that back, but it's going to slow down your overall training. So you're going to end up like in jujitsu with a guy who's, you know, got a brown belt guard and he's got a barely a, you know, a blue, wider blue belt kind of top game. So you have to tell someone, my, my coaches did it with me. They're like, okay, for the next six months, you can't go on your back. And you're like, what? You know, what am I, what am, so it forces you to do the, so those kind of things, even if they're just generalized like that, they don't have to be, you know, you don't have to go, well, what are these specific drills? You can just, I tell you what, it's, it's a general rule of thumb. You want to get, you want to get better at what you're doing, practice what you're not good at the most. Completely agree. I, I, I've said it almost in those words here on this show where we're, we're birds of a feather when it comes to this stuff. <laughs> now, when you, when you think back, mm-hmm. well, you talked about China, you talked a little bit about being here, but we're talking mostly about good stuff and good memories. So let's flip it a little bit. Mm-hmm. When you think about the times in your life that have been really difficult, mm-hmm. I'd like you to tell us about one of them and how you were able to lean on your martial arts, however you wanted to find that to get through. I mean, that happens all the time, right? I mean, you, you know, life's like that. So there, there's, uh, it's, it's, it's up and down. I mean, you know, it's, I think that, uh, it, it, it instead of like a, a specific incident, I feel like, you, you know, becomes the thing is the training and, and the kind of constant blows to your ego and, and, you know, the injuries, you know, I've had a lot, you know, you have a lot of injuries when you, you train at a little bit hot, harder level and you have to deal with all that stuff. And I think what happens is that just becomes part of your uh, nature. It's actually part of, part of you and your psyche. And uh, it, it, it will, it will be, it'll be there all the time. So, I mean, it could be a, every day we have, you know, something's going to, something's not going to go right. You know what I mean? So I feel like, I feel like uh, it's, it becomes, it becomes part of your nature and then it's just going to, it's just going to be there. It's, it's just part of your, your trained. It's part of your training. And then, you know, how, how we handle things. I feel, I feel, uh, you know, martial arts, I mean, some, some people that might make them more violent, for example, it's not a magic and it's not like a panacea for, you know, people are going to be Zen, like stoic, um, you know, take everything in a stride. It, it depends on, I think maybe your original personality and your makeup as well. So, uh, but for most of us, if you, if you have a discipline that long, you've trained that long, especially if you're, you know, you're doing things that are challenging, you're sparring with people that are stronger than you, you're competing at a higher level or, or even any level, you know, you start to understand that, that uh, there's going to be setbacks and blows to the ego. And then what you need to do is get over it and then, and then improve whatever that motivation is. So I, I think I was kind of a, uh, you know, this will sound, it just doesn't sound, it's not going to be the, you know, the, the uh, kind of best example, but this is true for me. I was fairly, um, I grew up in a, you know, I, I was fairly violent as a kid and that I, my reaction would be to, to tend towards, uh, uh, you know, aggression, I think. And over the years of training, I, I feel like it was very beneficial. Part of it was just the discipline of training, but part of it was, you know, you get your ass kicked a lot and, or when you're training and you, you start to realize, you know, there's always someone, always someone stronger than you, always someone more skilled than you. And it's probably a good idea to be polite in general. So even from that, from that aspect, you know, I get very young. I learned that I was like, you know, it's uh, not a good idea to, to, to be overly aggressive or to, or to, or to kind of look for trouble. There's always, you know, you can get in real trouble. And I feel like it's kind of like the yin and yang of that whole education. And, and then along with the discipline of training, I feel like, you, have, you know, you, you, you'll get a different perspective on things and that, and that becomes part of you. So whatever happens, uh, it's just your natural reaction now. And, and part of it is you're tempered by, by the training and the, and the knowledge that, you know, there's, there's, there's no reason to, to uh, cause any trouble. You know, we're hearing a bit of a theme for you with this, this willingness to accept where you have the opportunity for growth mm-hmm. and, and not just an acceptance of it, almost an embracing mm-hmm. of it. And it's something that I've found when I, when I spoke to folks on the show, it's something that is more common among the folks who have accomplished the most, who have gone the furthest. When I think about the people in 
the business world that I look up to, they're often talking about their failures and what they learn. And the folks who maybe have done some things, maybe have some admiration from others, who stay guarded about what they've failed at and focus only on their successes, they don't seem to go as far. What do you think about that? Well, I think, I think that's true for the most part. I think, uh, you know, you're, you, you have to constantly uh, watch, check your ego. So we all, you mean you need, an, we all have egos and you have to have an ego, right? It, but you have to real, I think a lot of it is pe- people, in my experience in martial arts, for example, I've known exceptional, exceptionally talented, physically talented people who train and, you know, they go to the academy and they, they'll dominate when they spar, they, but they'll never compete. Now, this is an example. Com- competition is not for everyone and it's not necessary for development, but just as an example, and the reason they, they'll make every excuse in the world, though, and the reason is they're, they're just afraid to lose. And it's like, that's the chance you take and everybody loses, you know, it, it, and at a certain point of their personal development and that kind of style, because it's, you know, say it's a, it's a combat sport, they're never really going to get it, get everything out of it they could have because their ego holds them back. You know what I mean? So I feel whatever it is for you, it doesn't, I'm, I'm using competition as an example because that's, that's what I know kind of. But for example, it could be, you know, it could be learning the next difficult kata. Who, who knows? You know, anything, anything that you, you feel that fear of failure, I feel, is what, what holds people back. And you have to be sensible. I mean, you know, there's a limit. You have to understand your limitations. But if, if, you're, not, if you're not failing sometimes, you're just not trying hard enough. You're, or you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not uh, trying at a high enough level. You're not challenging yourself enough. And if you're always if you're always doing really well and, and you're always winning at whatever, now nah, you need to go a little beyond that, right? Or the, it, it will be hard to have any kind of, um, kind of personal growth at it. So you're going to fail. Mm. That's the way it is. And then you get to see how you take it. My favorite quote on failure is from Michael Jordan. And you know, I don't know if you're at all a basketball fan. I was a big basketball fan back when I was in high school, back in the 90s. And there's this quote, and I pulled it up while you were saying it because I, I think it's so poignantly speaks to what you're saying. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, exactly. You got it. You know, even with that level of talent, right? So, you know, that's, and that's Michael Jordan. So, yeah. you, know, you, have to, uh, you have to keep practicing. And I think, too, I think one of the important things is also – You'll see in, in people at that level, no matter how good they get, they feel like they could be better. So it's like that, you know, you don't want to rest on your laurels kind of thing either. And it doesn't matter your age your, or, or your, your kind of inborn level of talent. It's for you, right? It's personal. So it doesn't mean you have to be the world's greatest basketball player. So you just, you look, you look at your own, you look at your own level of talent and, and your goals, and then you set goals, right? Like that, that are, that you think are attainable. but They have to be above wherever you are now. When you look back at your time training, Mm -hmm. you you already kind of alluded to how you you would answer this. So I'm going to shift it a little bit. You you mentioned that the people that have been involved in training you, that you consider their contributions fairly equal, Mm -hmm. that you needed all of them. So the question that I normally ask is, who is the most influential? But I've got a feeling that that question isn't going to be a, a simple one for you to answer and maybe even doesn't take us in a, um, a good direction. That might, might be unfair to you. So I would say if, if there was one of them, because you mentioned a number of them have passed away, if there was one that you could have had you know, another, another few weeks with, another you know, chunk of time, somebody that you thought had lessons waiting for you that you didn't get to learn, who would that be? I have, I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, but you're right though. I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it's not because like any, any one individual was, you know, everyone else kind of helped me a little on this. And one person was kind of like the guy, you know, like I said, it's, and I'm not just saying it's true. I mean, I wouldn't, you, you know, I wouldn't be, at whatever level I'm at or, or, or learned what I, you know, what I learned or, or had the accomplishments, whatever I've had, if it wasn't for all of my, my, my main teachers, but uh, just, just as a, as a, 
uh, interesting person. I had a teacher in Beijing named Liang Kequan, who was a uh, old master. He was born in the Qing Dynasty, so he trained with these very famous masters growing up. And uh, yeah, this kind of super colorful, storied life. Like when the Japanese were occupying, he had a platform fight. You know, you 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 go up on a lei tai like a big platform and and fight and and uh, he. He was just a 19 year old kid and he beat a kind of famous Japanese fighter and he got well known at the time. And then he fought in the war. Um, he fought, of course, against the Japanese. And then after the war, he uh, fought on the side of the nationalists. And of course, you know, the communists won. And he was, he was a fairly famous um, guy then as a soldier as well. So uh, he, he was, in, they imprisoned him for, for about 15 years. And then they let him out. But but they made him stay at the actual uh, uh, prison he was in a, and as, as like a uh, janitor, basically, for the next 15 years. So it was like 30 years, basically, of, of being incarcerated. And, and um, you know, later on, when he was older, he was, he was a famous teacher in Beijing. So he just as a, he would tell me stories, you know, about his life, um, just, like just, just the experiences he got. I mean, it's like, you know, you see it, if you saw it in a movie, you'd be like, no way. One of those kind of things. So all the things he's been through. So he was one of, I don't know, he was just so interesting. And like to this day, sometimes, you know, I, I, I have my first world problems and I'm complaining about some, you know, trivial, meaningless thing. I'll think about, you know, you think about guys like that, like all the stuff you went through and then you're like, man, life's not so bad. But he, he, he'd done a lot of stuff. And then he'd talk about the fights he'd had. And he was, you know, he had a couple of uh, challenge fights in the seventies and, and uh, just, you know, kind of whoop people. He was one of those guys, he he trained old school back in the day and his whole life was, was about martial arts and, and, uh, and all the stuff he'd done in the war. And they talked about the times he thought he was going to die. And he, he would, he would say things matter of factly, like, you know, we were, we were pinned down and, and there were no reinforcements and we ran out of bullets. So I was waiting to die, but then I didn't, that's how he would talk. And I'd be like, wow, like what kind of, you know, like, you know, the life you have to have where, you know, those kind of things don't, you know, don't even seem very dramatic. So he was, he was one person that, if, not even the martial arts part, that, you know, if, if, it would be interesting if, just to spend time with someone like that, just to see how, you know, the, just talk about their life view and, and all the things they learned. There, there, there's, excuse me, uh, that's a whole different generation, a different time. And I think there's no one like that left. So he would be, you know, if I, if I, could, if I could, like, bring one back, that, he would be the one, just, 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 just to be around him as a person, I think. And if you could add one person to the list of people you've trained with that you haven't anywhere in the world, anywhere in time, any style, who um, would that be? Well, he's still there. I think, you know, my, my, uh, my main Brazilian jiu-jitsu teacher, you know, I still see, I mean, he's, he's, he's Clever Luciano. He's, he's, uh, you know, he's fantastic. And I've had a lot of really good teachers, but I trained for a, a time with Hicks and Gracie who, is you know, I mean, the probably the greatest grappler of the modern of modern times. So, um, going to his classes and uh, Hickson still he's kind of semi-retired now. He he doesn't teach like open classes as much and he teaches seminars still. I mean, he he uh, I would and I'd like to in the future if I have an opportunity. I would train I would train more with Hickson. So he'd be one person that that comes to mind. Cool. Yeah, and an absolute legend and and. You know, BJJ is one of the disciplines that I've trained in the least. I think I've got three months to my credit, so I can I, I've I've done enough of it to appreciate it, to understand the 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 difficulty, mm -hmm. um, and and further appreciate those that are passionate in their training for it. But you know, man, I I, I watch guys like that. You know, I get to see some video, and, and we've even been blessed to have some incredible BJJ practitioners come on the show and. You know, when I watch video of them, it just blows my mind. It's, it is poetry in motion. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You know, so Hickson's, you know, he's the, not only the, like the kind of the best at, at, at doing it, kind of fighting or, or grappling, it's, it's just his, uh, uh, he has a whole like different outlook on it. And, and the way he, he approaches the, the art is, um, you know, I mean, it depends on, on, Kind of like what you like and how you learn, but for me, it's 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 uh, 
completely like uh, fascinating, you know, just, just to see the thought process and how, and how he approaches it. Mm. So uh, yeah, that would be excellent. Nice. Let's, let's lighten it up a little bit. If we talk about martial arts movies, you got any favorites in there? Are you at all a fan of the mm-hmm. Kung Fu time. flick? Oh yeah, of course. I still have to say my all time favorite is Enter the Dragon. Cause when I was a kid, a little kid, that's when Bruce Lee was, you know, making his movies. So you know, I, I just, uh, it's probably a bias now from just being a child. And, but, uh, I think he can't, I think he can't be Enter the Dragon as a martial arts movie. It's fantastic. Now testing a theory. Is that the first Bruce Lee movie you saw? Uh, no, no, I saw, you know, he, okay. when I was a little boy, the Green Hornet was on and I can still remember, I vaguely remember it. I was like small, very small, but I can still remember though. We'd watch the Green Hornet. Nobody cared about the Green Hornet. We wanted to see Cato kick somebody in the face. So that was <laughs> when I first remember Bruce Lee. And you know, his, his early movies came out and, uh, you know, they're all great, right? Even the, you know, his earliest, uh, his earliest movies were good, but then I'm, when End of the Dragon came out, I was a little bit older and, you know, it was, it was kind of Western produced and that the whole, you know, so that's, that's gotta be uh, my all time favorite martial arts. And there's a lot of good movies. I remember the original uh, Shaolin Temple came out with the Jet Li movie. I thought was, was really, was fantastic. You know, it was a kind of tr- traditional Chinese martial arts, you know, thing. I, I really, I think that's gotta be number two. So those are my two favorites. Nice. Yeah. The, the theory that you're one of the few who breaks it, is that the first Bruce Lee movie you see is your favorite Bruce Lee movie? Yeah, no. I get what was the first one that I forgot the name when he goes to Thailand and he beats up the, oh. the drug boss guys. And that was the yeah. first one I saw, like the Chinese connection, was it, or Big Boss, one of the whatever it was. They that blur was, for me, I'll admit. Yeah, that was the first <laughs> one, but I, yeah, nothing, nothing's gonna, nothing's gonna top uh, Enter the Dragon. No, no, we, we did I a whole episode on it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I cut you off. I just said I know every line in the movie. Oh, nice. I, I, won't, I won't test you on that. Nice. I'm sure you know more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did, we did a whole episode on that, just kind of dug deep. And this might be a good time to let listeners know, if you're new to the show, we do have links and show notes and everything over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And any of the stuff that we talk about like this, there will be more material. Hmm. Now, is Bruce Lee your favorite actor? Martial arts actor? Um, or is it somebody a little more modern? Yeah, I'd have to say probably. You know what else too? Being in when I was in a when I lived in in Taiwan as well. You know, Jackie Chan was kind of in his in his prime. You know, and uh, he I, I love Jackie Chan as well. I think his movies were uh, especially the movies like through the kind of late eighties, early nineties. That that time he it's very his his Chinese movies are kind of very much for Chinese audiences. You know, there's a lot of humor in them and that kind of thing, but. Uh, but they were great. I mean, they're great entertainment and that, that level of, you know, his, his stunts and the things, you know, Jackie Chan's like, you put him in a room and he looks around and he can just create, you know, how he can create such fantastic movement um, is, is also great. So, you know, I, I would say, I like Jack, I mean, as, as just, just as an actor for martial arts movies, I would, it might be Jackie Chan. My favorite. Hong Jin Bao, that whole group back then I thought were, were great. You know, I, I think when people talk about Bruce Lee, they talk about Bruce Lee for his, his creativity, his fluidity with his choreography and just his on-screen presence. When they talk about Jack, uh, Jackie Chan, they're talking about not only his combat skill, but his ability to string humor through right. his fights, even if they're not funny. There's just, there's somehow, there's this playful element right. to him that I think we all appreciate. Yeah, exactly. That's why he's, he's still good. I mean, he's just he's Jackie Chan. He's, he's Jackie Chan. Yeah. And then the final of our, let's say, cultural questions. How about books? Martial arts books? Any uh, in your library that you might recommend to the folks listening? Oh, uh, yeah. I have a lot of, I got a lot of martial arts books. Um, I mean, it would depend on what they're into. You know what I mean? And there's, I mean, there's hundreds of books and there's lots of, lots of really good books. It depends. I mean, it, you know, books, it's hard to say. There's, there's, there's like the classic books that were written by the masters. And then there's books on history and philosophy. And then there's how to do, you know, how to books. So, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't pick. It, it would depend on what your, someone's interest was. And, you know, they want history, they want technique, they want, you know, whatever. And what style and that, that'd be hard to say. There, there's so many. Let's say 
let's pick one, even if it's not going to be relevant to everyone that would be listening. The, the one book that comes to mind that kind of came out of nowhere for you, that you said, oh, you know, I'll read this. And then you put it down and went, wait a second. I wasn't expecting to get that out of it or to get that much out of it. Or this has completely made me look differently at X. Also hard. Any surprises? You know, I'll I'll tell you that. Nah, I mean, it's it's still it's it's kind of like asking me about my favorite teacher. It's there's a lot of it's in my mind. There's two there there's it's, there's too many different you know variables. I guess to look at it. If you if I had a you ask me about a specific style or something, maybe I could. But uh, I I don't know. I mean, I've I've read like, literally hundreds of of martial arts books. I really couldn't say. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Now let's talk about the future. We've talked a lot about the past. Let's put our eyes forward. You're still teaching, right? You're still training, right? Training every day, right? Clearly, you're still passionate about martial arts. Mm, I, I mean, you you can you can teach, but the moment you're training, I mean, when someone's training every day, they're training because they love it. Right. You know, I don't I don't know. I can't think of a, of a cause, a reason where someone would be training every day for decades and doing it despite their dislike of it. Right? <laughs> yeah. That wouldn't make sense. No. So the question then is why? When you look forward, are there goals? Are there things you're trying to accomplish? Is there, is there a next level? What, what is your why? Um, I, it's like we talked about in the beginning. So, I mean, you know, the basic level, it's, it's how you stay in shape because this is what I know. You know what I mean? I don't lift weights and I don't run and I don't do, I just practice like, uh, you know, the things that I do and most of it's martial arts based. Um, there's that. And then, uh, I'm a coach. I mean, I'm a professional martial arts teacher. So, you, you know, my, my, uh, duty is to, is to be, the best teacher you can be, right? You, for your students, that's only, you know, if you're, if you're going to, if you're, like you just said, if you're, say you're good at martial arts and you, you had a career and you retired and now you teach because you're well-known or you teach whatever and you're just, you're just kind of phoning it in, you should, you should get another career, right? That's not fair to the people that are coming to your classes. So I try to streamline my training. I teach a lot of seminars. Um, you know, so I've, I've, I have these, it's been very fortunate. I've been, it's been fortunate for my, for my development as a teacher. So you know, you say you have only so many hours with a group and you're never going to maybe see some of these guys again. Like, how can you convey useful information that you feel like they can take with them and put into anything they do? So I look at it from that point of view. And then, of course, my ongoing students, you know, um, you want to you wanna make them as good at, at whatever it is as, as, as quickly as possible. And then, of course, it's there. The student has to do the work, but you've, you've got to give them the, the tools to do it. And that's your... And then I also feel as a, as a coach, every person's different. Pe people have the same, people will learn in certain ways. Some people, you have to show them, some people have to do it on them, some people can watch. But, you know, individuals all have individual needs, right? And I think it's the job of the teacher to pay attention to everyone that, and, and try to, you know, with, within the, the time constraints and the, the class to help, help them as individuals. So from the teaching perspective, I, I, don't, I don't think you can ever be the very best teacher. You got to try to keep streamlining your process and, and uh, you know, getting better at teaching. And then the only way to do that is if you're good at it, how, how are you going to teach something you're not good at? You don't know, right? So I try to, you know, I try to improve my, uh, you anyway, know, as you get older too, I, you'll eventually start to, physicality will start to, to drop off, right? You're not going to be as fast when you're whatever age, you know, 80 is when you're 20, but there's, there are other elements you can, you can, you can improve upon, I feel. So I, I, I look a lot at that. I think like in my own training, you know, I try to keep the physicality at the highest level I can keep it, but then there's other variables. Like how about sensitivity? How about, you know, uh, making every technique as efficient as possible or, or, you know, you seek out instruction when you don't know something. And then that's the self-cultivation part we talked about. I feel, I feel like that, that improvement is exciting still for me. I feel I feel like I can improve in whatever areas and that's exciting for me. And then it make, then I, then I try to, you know, uh, kind of use, use that information ability in teaching my, stu my students. So, you know, it's kind of like you're everyone, you're like a parent, you know, you see people get something and it doesn't matter what level, you know, I had a, I had a student one time, um, middle-aged guy and he, he worked heavy construction. He was super strong. And, 
for the life of him, like he couldn't back roll. I don't know why, for whatever reason. And like we worked on it, worked on it. And it took him, I don't know how long it was. It took him maybe three or four months. And then he back rolled one day and the whole class started clapping. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's super like, uh, uh, satisfying as a teacher. So and then, you know, I have pros when an MMA fight, I was just as happy when I got into back roll. So, you know, you want to kind of, you know, help people out with whatever they need. And, and that's the, you know, my, that's my profession part. Cause now I've, you know, I've retired from competition now. So it's all about besides my own personal development, but now it's more about my students. Makes sense. It's a great why, right? We, we progress so much I would even say more when we focus on serving others. You know, I don't know about you, but when I started teaching, the my skill progressed. Well, that's true. Rapidly. I yeah. Mean, just, you know, the the more you focus on other people, and I can I can hear it as you're talking about training others. You know, and you said it at kind of at the top of the show when you were talking about working the grappling side with some pro MMA fighters. I mean, just there was a a bit of joy that came through in your voice. I can hear. I can hear how much that resonates for you, how important that is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, if you, like I said, if you really don't, if you're only teaching because, uh, you, you know, you know, martial arts, you're making a living. I feel, I feel like that's not really the right, the right reasons, you know? So you really have to want, here's, here's the thing. If, if every teacher made at least some of their students better than them, and then they did the same thing, the whole arts on the, you know, it's, it's on the upward spiral of getting, you know, better, right? You don't, you don't want to, you don't want to hold back or you don't want your, you don't, you don't want to keep anything. Or sometimes teachers get a little bit uh, jealous, you know, their students. It's like, that's a weird thing. It, I mean, if you teach someone and they practice hard and they do well, I mean, just, just from the pure ego standpoint, you get a credit, right? So I don't, mm. I don't understand why everyone doesn't want their students to excel. I don't yeah. either. <laughs> Whenever we talk about people that, that hold back knowledge or, or anything like that. It just, I, I can't, I can't empathize with it. I don't understand it. Yeah. Now, if folks want to reach you, if they want to find you online, social media, websites, you know, what, what do you got? Um, well, I, ha- I have my website. Um, it's shun, S-H-E-N-W-U.com. Um, and then uh, the academy I work at is Ace Jiu Jitsu. So it's A-C-E-J-I-U-J-I-T-S-U.com. You can, you can look us up. And uh, I teach I, li- I teach in Southern California and Orange County. So if anyone's ever uh, in Southern California and want to come by and train, they're, they're more than welcome to come. Awesome. Great. Now, I appreciate your time here today. You've been really open. And, you know, I've had a good time talking. I'm sure the listeners have as well. But if I could trouble you for one more thing, mm-hmm. what final words would you share with everyone today? Um, I think just to, to reiterate what I talked about before, I think, you know, no matter, I think no matter what you practice, it's a good idea to be open-minded. You know what I mean? And, and, uh, you know, if you're interested in, in, in martial arts in general, it's good to, to be interested in, in, in any information and look at other things. I think cross training is a good idea for most people. I feel that you also need to be clear on even, even sometimes people have practiced martial arts a long time. They don't seem to be completely clear on why they're, why they're training or what they want out of it. And I, I think they, they, I mean, they love martial arts and they, they have an, uh, a vague idea of why they're doing it. But I think if you can, if you can focus your, your uh, training and your energy towards more specific goals, it, it's, it's, it will help expedite the whole improvement process. For example, I mean, do I want to compete or do I do, I do this? Is it only self-cultivation? Do I do it for self-defense? all perfectly valid reasons to train. And uh, I think sometimes, you know, you just have to be clear on those kind of things. And then you have short-term goals and you have your long-term goals. And not, not that you can't do other things or, or train for other reasons, whatever, but I feel having a clear purpose is, is invaluable in maximizing like your, your training time and, and um, taking advantage of your talents. And the last thing is we said before, whatever you're doing, you need to sometimes in whatever whatever format it's a good idea to go out of your comfort zone a little bit and test yourself and uh you know you you, you'll you'll it it might be hard at at the time but i feel in the long run you're going to find it it was it was maybe some of the 
one of the, you know, some of the best things you could ever do for your own development. Quite often, martial artists will get themselves into camps. You know, this is better than that, or this is the right way, and this is the wrong way. And I didn't hear any of that from Mr. Carmel. What I heard was a genuine openness to training in many forms with many kinds of people, and a realization that whatever element to his training he lacked the most, that was the place for the most growth, the most opportunity, and the place that he was going to focus. It's something that I've been conscious of myself, something we've talked about on the show, so it was really refreshing to hear it expressed so articulately. So thank you for that, as well as the multitude of other insights that you shared with us today, sir. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you being on the show. If you want to check out the show notes, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find them all there. Episode 354. There's some good stuff there. Trust me. Check it out. Don't forget, you can find all of our products at whistlekick.com. Use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on maybe our new Luminary uniform or one of the variety of types, styles of protective equipment that we've got. Or if you're listening to this in the future, that code's still going to work and we've got a ton of other stuff. Oh, and you can use it on the shirts and the hoodies and all the other good stuff we've got. Use it on anything. And we do free shipping. Enough trying to sell you. Though I do appreciate those of you supporting the show in that way. If you want to reach us on social media, we are at Whistlekick, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. And you can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Would love to know your suggestions for future guests. I always appreciate that. That's all for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.